Ralph here once again. It is the 18th of April, this 2021, at our usual time, about 12.45 a.m. And what are we looking at right off the bat? Well, we are going to break apart the media when they tend to erroneously make the claim, i.e. conjecture, that the states which are showing high infection rate spikes, in their words, alarmingly or crisis is their key words, uh, is it the fault of those states that have very few pandemic restrictions, if any restrictions at all. We tend to really look at the mask mandates more than anything else as far as the, the stringency of those restrictions. So we have North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Wisconsin, and they all surround Minnesota. The question is, which one of these states must be infecting Minnesota, or vice versa? Is Minnesota infecting these states, or is there any correlation at all? Let's look at Michigan. Same thing here. Michigan has a very sharp spike is the word in infection rates so who is contributing to it if michigan has these huge tight lock pandemic lockdowns or strings the index and then we'll be looking at this one too because new hampshire as of the 16th of april dropped the mask mandate so i want to see if there's any correlation or if the media is just highly confused so remember we looked at that we looked at the confusion matrix in reference to um the antigen test when testing asymptomatic individuals. And if you recall, the false positive rate of asymptomatic individuals when tested with the antigen test is 72%. Meaning if someone tested positive and they were asymptomatic, 72% likelihood that they did not, it was a false positive. And then we looked at the reproduction rate, remember last week, and we looked for any correlation with reproduction rates and no correlation in reference to the uh, you know infection rates of mortality, but there was a strong correlation with stringency indexes and vaccine rates. So without further ado, let's get into the, my favorite part, and that is the research aspect because this is some interesting research this week. So let's begin. First one, the one year of SARS-CoV-2 evolution. Remember when they said back long time ago, if you give us 15 days and we'll flatten the curve, then it was supposed to be done by Easter, and it was supposed to be done by June, July. You know, it's, it's like a gamble, just one more dollar per se. So what they did here is they looked at the types of mutations, the predominant mutations. For example, now this has to do probably more with antigenic drift in reference to the mutation, not necessarily a shift or a viral pathogen replacement. So D641G which is the predominant one in the United States. Well, the original form of SARS-CoV-2 vanished approximately after four months and became replaced about 80% of D614G. Now you only can find parts of the original virus circulating in Africa without the D641G mutation. That is just food for thought. That gives you an idea why it's so difficult to actually make a real vaccine uh, because Anytime anything enters the environment the first time, it's just like throwing dice. It's going to mutate and mutate and mutate. Now, when you look at things like measles, mumps, or pertussis that have been around for a long, long, long period of time, you know, it's kind of like settled. But in the beginning, like this, think about it. But here is the most interesting aspect. And again, this is kind of a mixture of conjecture and hypothesis. I'm not an immunologist, but these people are. And... This part you'll find quite intriguing. And this is a reference to E484K, which many of us have never heard of in the United States, but now you will. Basically, it is thought that this mutation was driven by high levels of population immunity. Let that sink in. It is thought that this mutation was driven by high levels of population immunity, which drove mutations in the spike protein to evade the immune system. So, Think about this. You have virtually herd immunity. And so you think the game is over. But, and I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong in reference to this because I'm not an immunologist and I love to have an immunologist uh, put their input into this. So often viruses, they want to evolve to have a higher transmission rate, more so than a higher mortality rate or actually harming the host. I want to word it kind of like a parasite, but however, though, viruses traditionally and not classified as being alive, yet for some unusual reason, they appear to be sentient um, with a 
making decisions and not based purely upon randomness. So here we have that aspect. We have that drift, antigenic drift. Shift it would be if it mixes with another type of virus. And the people are immune. They're already immune. And then this mutation happens because of the immunity. Now, it doesn't mean, for example, it becomes more lethal, but it can become more transmissible. And I think that's what we're seeing quite a bit of, especially like with the B117, which we're going to review towards the end as well. But I want to repeat that one line. It is thought that this mutation was driven by high levels of population immunity. Again, the key word here is thought. All right. In Brazil, there have been several reports of healthcare workers and other people with antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 being reinfected with variants, not the same, not the same one, but variants with the E484K mutant, raising concerns about vaccine protection against the variant. Now, again, if you started testing people, for example, with uh, against cytomegalovirus, uh, you know, and you find uh, you could you could do a whole marketing campaign in reference to cytomegalovirus. Yeah, it's highly transmissible. A lot of people have it, but then you never hear about it because why? Very few people are hospitalized due to it, even though complications can occur. And so, again, all because you have a higher mutation rate with a higher transmissibility. Your curve may have been flattened. It's just looking for a place to camp out. That's kind of like it the way it is without necessarily harming the host. And sometimes too, again, immune balancing, strength in the immune system, immune modulation. Uh, you know, not everything that says the word virus necessarily means bad per se. Kind of like when I took nutrition back in college in the early 1980s, they were in the impression that all bacteria were bad. Well, again, times change. Next research as follows, which is something which is good. Shelter in place, bad. Physical activity linked to more severe COVID-19 infection and death, surpassed only by advanced age in organ transplant as a risk factor. So now let's look at this real fast. This is inactive during the two years preceding the pandemic. Now, many people have been inactive for an entire year since the pandemic. And if physical activity is this powerful mitigation factor against uh, succumbing to an illness, then when you uh, issue a shelter in place order, per se, uh, or a lockdown or whatever prison terminology you want to utilize at the moment, as you can tell, I'm not a fan of that strategy. Uh, basically, you may want to utilize the caveat that physical activity is something of importance even so where if you're closing gyms down and causing people to shelter in place it would be responsible some way socially to make sure that people have the venue to be active in a way that doesn't harm them expecting people to exercise with masks on or run or jog uh, we want to get to that point in a second because the British Medical Journal is going to cover that aspect for us in the next article. But this is how powerful it is. Are you ready? Here we go. So let's go boom, 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 boom. They the individuals and I'm looking for the, here we are. After taking into account, basically there, I wanted to highlight it. After taking account of potentially influential factors such as race, age, and underlying medical conditions, patients with COVID-19 who are consistently physically inactive were more than twice as likely to be admitted to the hospital as those who clocked up 150 minutes of physical activity every week. Now, 150 minutes divided by seven days. How many minutes per day were you only expect an individual to be exercising? Not that much. They were also 73% more likely to require intensive care and two and a half times more likely to die of infection. So we just round them. So you have the pandemic going around and you say, hey, you know what? If you do your part, instead of just waiting for the government to subsidize your immune system, i.e., uh, why don't you just take 25 minutes out of the day, walk around the block with some friends up a hill, do some jumping jacks, whatever it is. Let's build a firewall. And if we can maintain a physically active and physically fit population, guess what? The next pandemic per se, um, well, depends how you define a pandemic. 
So let's leave that for the future. Uh, epidemiologist, immunologist, then hopefully we do a better job next time. So that's important. After taking into account potential influential factors such as race, age, and underlying medical conditions, twice as likely to be admitted to a hospital as those who clocked up to 150 minutes plus of physical activity each week. We're not talking a lot of time. We're talking couch time. We're talking 130 minutes sitcom with commercials. They're also 73% more likely to require intensive care and two have more times likely to die. If you, so if you're fearful of the pandemic, if you are truly concerned with the pandemic, do your part. Be active. All right, so, and again, the links to all the research articles will be on the YouTube channel, so you can follow it on your own and uh, delve into it and maybe discover something I didn't see. Um, again, we'll see. Uh, next, the exercise issue with the masks. This goes on the heels of the study that we just did last week and it would, of individuals uh, without any comorbidities, young individuals dying instantly due to wearing a face mask, correlation-wise. Can't draw a causal argument yet, but it's like a crime scene, and the most likely suspect is the face covering. Now, a hypothesis, according to the researchers last week, was due to lactic acid, I believe, causing heart arrhythmias or heart malfunction, per se. And uh, this plays into that right after that one article we did last week. Quote, where is also reported increased shortness of breath and claustrophobia at higher exercise intensity. So let's get past this point. Let's get right to the data itself, which is really weird because, again, I didn't never thought of claustrophobia. But, again, this is for a psychologist, which I am not, obviously. And, uh, you know, I until I started querying uh, the individuals around me, my small perspective or sphere, uh, a lot of them feel claustrophobic when we're in the masks and that yields a higher anxiety level and so these are things that have to be addressed in the future i mean i never would think about that because that's not part of my perception but claustrophobia due to facial coverings is for a lot of individuals and i know people say do your part whatever it comes down to be nothing data 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 and again you have links to this data as well as i do so let us proceed how bad is it analyst 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 Analysis of the recorded data showed that compared with not wearing a face mask, and I just want to highlight this right here, and I'm going to make it a little bigger because sometimes it takes about a week before the 4K kicks in. Analysis of the recorded data showed that compared with not wearing a fake cloth face mask, wearing one led to a significant reduction in exercise time, 14%, in physiological measures of capacity. This part irks me because the reason being is all of us, well, be, unless you don't have a TV, we're told in the very beginning by these pundits that no, it does not affect VO2 max or anything along those lines. How many of us heard, oh, extras wearing a face mask does not affect your exercise capacity at all? Well, it turns out, and to be in their favor, a lot of their, the studies they were quoting were done on elderly individuals walking briskly on a treadmill, not real training athletes. But I digress proceed and don't want to incorporate something called publisher bias and publisher bias just means my opinion and physiological measures of capacity including maximal oxygen consumption vo2 max a 29 percent reduction all right now keep in mind this is a small study for those statisticians out there and understand the power rating the power rating is probably not very high but it beats survey monkey which is what the other researchers did in the beginning in order to justify the use of masks during exercise. Survey Monkey is the data that they utilized, but to proceed, including maximum oxygen, that's why it's sources are real important. Maximum oxygen capacity, VO2 max, 29% reduction in maximal heart rate, as well as increased shortness of breath, i.e. as well as the claustrophobia and chorus, the the responses, you don't have to be too imaginative as far as feeling hard to breathe, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And then the feelings, again, this is for psychologists, not for I, but again, this can be parroted by a lot of individuals, claustrophobic, suffocated, and anxious. So for your bureaucrats out there or policymakers, or whatever you are, you're inflicting this on your population. Claustrophobia, feeling like they're suffocating, and anxious. And again, that's going to have some aspect in reference to PTSD a little bit later on because a lot of us, including myself, 
I don't want to hear the word pandemic for quite some time. It's too many people seem to be taking some sort of enjoyment in this, and that's what concerns me the most. But this is what we experience as those that have these policies um, incorporated upon us. It says, our results do not fully explain how mask wearing might directly limit cardiovascular function. Again, refer to the research we did last week. Now you see how it all ties in. The British Medical Journal researchers go to the research that we covered last week. And what did they say? Lactic acid buildup. But let us proceed to the next article as follows because it knows a lot of attention towards the B117 variant. And this is what they discovered from an observational study. And this also, again, using the word parrot, uh, parrot, no, I don't use the word mimic. Uh, like the data that we're going to look at when we look at the data analysis coming into basically following the graph lines down. Because all of a sudden now Britain, it's like, what a virus. But here we go. An observational study of patients in London suggests that the B117 variant is not, I reiterate, not associated with more severe illness and death, but also appears to lead to a higher viral load. Consistent with emerging evidence that this lineage is more transmissible. Remember the first shot we had right here? When we discussed that basically viruses like to increase the transmission rate, but not necessarily increase the lethality if they were sentient by some aspect. This lineage is more transmissible than the original COVID-19 strain, which the original COVID-19 strain is seen only in a few areas in the world uh, now at all. And that's parts of Africa. That's odd. And so that's kind of interesting. And so B117 is it's not as scary as the media spent media. I don't care if it's Fox News or CNN. I listen to both of them, believe it or not. I listen to one on the way to work, and I listen to one on the way back to work, and I switch it up each time just in case I'm not in a great mood going to work or from work. And a reality, I hate to say it, both news stations, they I don't listen to, just to digress, I don't listen to so much what they're the news are trying to purport because 70% of your news comes from uh, uh, government pools. That was back in the 1990s. Now, who knows how much your news is actually all comes out of the government. Uh, but, you know, and then what happens is CNN says something, which then Fox News brings up what the CNN anchor said, and the CNN anchor says what the Fox News anchor says, and they form this symbiotic relationship and where news reporters are reporting on news reporters what other news reporters said. And that's not news. That's gossip. So that was my digress. And, but however, though, they all said the B117 strain was this massive concern. And thank goodness for the Lancet. Uh, they did the observational studies and may not be so. The Lancet also said when we first started doing this, I think this is our 27th review. They also said that 80% of the world was going to be uh, infected with uh the, whatever the variant SARS-CoV-2 is. Uh, and they just said the lethality was going to go down. But they did say 80% in the very, very, very beginning. This is way back, I think, in March of last 2020. And um, 80% of the world. And um, the Lancet, you know, I sometimes disagree with what they have to say. But however, though, they've been pretty on key with this one quite some time. And um, if you, they, if they said there was nothing you could do to stop it. But however, though, um, my bureaucrats think they're smarter than nature. So let us go backward. This is interesting. Of course, going back to nature. COVID-19 in our dust may help predict outbreak study fines. Now, this is kind of ironic because just this week they said that COVID-19 is not on surfaces, don't clean up so much, and so on and so forth. But they were part right. So if you were testing a desk or you were testing a box or an aluminum surface and you were checking for SARS-CoV-2 RNA or whatever it is, you're not going to find it necessarily. But however, though, are you ready for this? A study done in rooms where COVID-19 patients were isolated shows that the virus RNA part doesn't mean it's transmissible because it could be broken up kind of like that. And it could still be there, but not in a transmissible form. Part of genetic material, they don't know is what it really comes down to inside a virus can persist up to a month in dust. Remember Legionnaire's disease? Legionnaire's disease lasts months and months and months. But however, though, for example, when it comes to COVID-19, persists a month in dust. So it makes sense that they look at this. 
And the interesting part about that is how much of SARS UV 2 RNA is in the dust that they tested, or how much dust did they test that had the SARS CoV 2 RNA. You ready for this? Here we go. Now let's make this bigger once again, too, just in case it hasn't processed the 4K as of yet. They found the genetic material from SARS UV 2 virus, the virus that causes CoV COVID 19, like something else does, in 97% of the bulk dust samples, 97% and 55% on the surface swabs. But see what's happened there? It's in the dust. Uh, and the cleaning crews sprayed a chlorine base that affected the rooms prior to cleaning. The researchers believe the disinfectant destroyed the envelope of caps of the outer coats of iron the virus, likely def defanging it for transmission, defanging. So when the research team tested the samples when they arrived in the lab shortly after the rooms were cleaned, then tested the samples again weekly after four weeks, the virus, after four, the clean, keep in mind, the clean of the room, after four weeks, the virus RNA did not significantly decay in the vacuum bags. We weren't sure the genetic material will survive. There are many different organisms in dust and we weren't sure we'd see any viral RNA at all. And we're surprised we found that the actual RNA itself seemed to be lasting a pretty long time. So, again, it's a lot of pandemic mitigation strategy. If there's a similar pandemic in the future, uh, gosh forbid, I hope there's not any pandemics. But uh, dust filtration seems to be a, a pretty heavy, heavy venue outside of UVA. If you see my picture right down here. That's a, oops, that's a UVA 254, a UVC 254 light, which I shouldn't have on because it's extremely damaging to the skin and eyes, but that's a UVC 254. And that one does, uh, been shown, I should say, I don't want to make a causal statement to really, really be work very well in deactivating SARS-CoV-2 infectivity, but it's not healthy to have on. But I just want to leave that on, for example. And it's because I was doing a little TikTok thing for fun. A-B testing, let's put it that way. And there's an A-B right there, that's why. And so, yeah. And so, the UV light, dust filtration, ventilation, those are going to be the, the pretty much the, the, strong, the strongest things out there. Kind of reminds me of during the white plague of tuberculosis, you had the sanatoriums. So let us proceed as follows. So then to the research itself. So in the media, is their conjecture appropriate in blaming high infection rates on states with low pandemic mitigation um, lockdown strategies? So here we go. Are you ready? So here we are, Minnesota. Here is our infection rate rise. We share on the same y-axis for those that are familiar. And we're looking at the transmission of the border states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Special note to Wisconsin because it's behind, it's between two states experiencing high infection rates. Yet there's Wisconsin. They don't really share a land border, but still just the same. And here we go. You're a researcher, you're a scientist, you're an epidemiologist, you're a statistician. Correlation wise, doesn't mean there can be some other confounding factors involved. Like they can hate each other and have walls built up all around each other and making sure no one from Minnesota travels to any of these states. But however, though, your job is to make the determination. Are these poor misguided states with no pandemic mitigation lockdown strategies causing Minnesota's level to rise? Again, if you had to look at that, what would you think? Or is Minnesota on the opposite end do dysbiosis? poor ventilation, shelter in place, and everything else that could possibly cause an individual to hang on to that virus as long as possible, are they responsible for the virus existing in these low pandemic mitigation strategy states? Your call. You can word it any way you want to. It just depends on how you're attempting to market your view of the pandemic. All right, new cases smooth per 100,000. Again, Minnesota, right there. And that's just to graph it out in case you want to look at that one separately. Then case to the hospitalization ratio. So what this is, for example, is number of cases and how many how many of those cases result in hospitalization. Minnesota still even the top of that, but you know it's, it's more subtle that way. 
even though the case is pretty low. Uh, just again, you could draw from that what you want. Again, this is from March 15th. Uh, right here, if you read this, though, shut up. Oh, I apologize. March 1st, uh, going up to this April 17th. And then let's look at the other ones. Now we are going to look at, and I put the map on each one. Let's look at Michigan. All right, here we have boom, 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 three tightly restricted lockdown, no civil liberty states where we don't want to see anybody's face, and Wisconsin. And here we go. Let's see what we do. And just to be fair, sharing the same y-axis, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin. Look at the infection rates. And even though these are tightly regulated uh, states, there you are, Wisconsin. Remember, I'm a big, big fan of controls. So we'll say Wisconsin is our control. And Wisconsin is not only our control, Wisconsin is in between these two states. So it's between Michigan and it is in between Minnesota. So here you are, Wisconsin, right there as a control, being hammered by two different states on each side with virtually no pandemic mitigation strategy. And it's like, it's not, it's not there. But it doesn't seem to make a difference even with the other transmission, uh, the transmission in the other states too. The objective is that, again, there could be other confounding factors. But again, we're just drawing more observations. And from those observations, we are in using our Bayesian mentality of uncertainty in order to draw a conclusion. And there it is. Boom, boom, boom. There's Michigan. There's our other states next to it. What the heck? Again, what the heck? I, what the heck? So I, this why is, I, and, uh, yeah, again, what the heck? I mean, maybe that's why Canada is having problems. There's maybe they, maybe they can blame it on Canada, but you can't blame it on Wisconsin. So, and you can't blame it on loose restriction states. So wherever the news is coming up with its very, very short-sighted, erroneous, superfluous, almost um, whatever, maniacal uh, aspect in order to basically cause crisis or whatever word you want to use. Is it crisis or alarmingly? Those are the two most common words used in over and over again. Now it's being used on everything else. Crisis and alarmingly and da-da-da-da. But no, uh, newscasters, whether it's Fox, CNN, whoever, no, they can do this too. They got great data analytic people. If Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or every one of you, what are your uh, heroes or idols are, they got tons of money. They could do this just as well as probably far better than me at 1.13 a.m. in the morning on April 18th that does this as a hobby. So back to our hobby epidemiology. So here we go. Do, do, do. Now this one is important. Now if you notice right here before I proceed, New Hampshire, as of this 16th, do, 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 right there is dropping the mask mandate. And again, I like to have controls. And we'll just consider this a study with the washout period. All right, so we're really going to look at this next week and see if we notice any difference. But here, are, these are all tightly controlled states. And we're not sharing the same y-axis. We're sharing different y-axis, y-axises. So you can see increases in the transmission rates. All right. Now, obviously, they are not sharing the same effect as our, our lightly controlled states like these guys, which is kind of weird. Because again, they're doing all this stuff, and yet, again, we're trying to make pandemic mitigation strategies. Is it justified? I don't know. Let's let's not share the y-axis real fast. Let's take this y-axis off and see how. Where is my share? Uh, figure H space at a da font size, color da da. Y equals one, the subtitle, what the heck is that? Y equals one, hang on a second. Let's just do this real fast. We are going to, oh, that's a subtitle. That's our count. Oh, right here, but oh, there it is. Sorry about that, please forgive me. Share Y equals, whoops, freaking keyboard's reversed, stop it, true. All right, now what we're gonna do is we are gonna share the y-axis. So I'm just changing the code real fast. 
And so you see this right here, you see the different numbers. So we can get a better perspective, how they compare to each other. There we are, you see? Now they're sharing the same y-axis. So you can see Connecticut's a little bit there, New Hampshire's right there, and there's New York. And so you get an idea. But outside of that, there's the rise. And that's why I did that, because Connecticut just seems to be sitting up there for quite some time. And then New Hampshire, again, that's at the 16th. Maskless. Uh, they're still recommending it, but nah. You remember, or do you hear Oregon? Oregon's going to try to, they're making the suggestion they're going to wear masks in businesses forever. That's a great way to create dysbiosis and make people get lots and lots of wrinkles around their mouth. And so risk to benefit ratio. It's like almost like you think about it, and this is to digress. It's like you have to ask yourself the question, evolutionary. Why do we have a mouth and a nose? And so it's because Oregon doesn't seem to jive with evolutionary biology because they all of a sudden believe now that the mouth and nose is not only redundant, it may be even dangerous. So let's put a wrapper over it. So here it goes, da da da, and so we'll see what happens. Cases to hospitalization ratio, do do do. Pretty simple. Look at New York, how low it is. So again, remember we run out of ventilators and stuff like that, da 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 da. We had big cities and we had ships out there. Oh, boy, they played us really well. And let's get into the other research as follows. Reproduction rate we already did last week, do do, machine mage. All right, this is our money collar prediction. This is the, the University of Washington who said, wow, if you're wearing a mask, it's 30% less. And that's where it is if you don't wear masks, which again, I don't know where they get their data from, but let's go here. New deaths current in the United States. This is our data from the 1st of January. I'm speaking kind of fast, please forgive me, but I want to move forward because uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. And there it is. Do, 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 do. Uh, again, I know people are going to say medical treatments got better, but you know, not sending infected individuals to long-term care facilities where they're very, very vulnerable was probably, probably the greatest factor in reducing that level down. Um, as far as also two susceptible individuals, unfortunately, always seem to succumb first in uh, pandemics. And as we began to test the asymptomatic individuals, younger, healthy individuals, and there was an outlier here or there, some young individuals did succumb, but however, the percentage of uh, began to go down. So there it is, the Monte Carlo figure. If accurate, it's going to go down there. This is about 100 iterations. There are some outliers there. And here's an outlier here, new deaths per million. So there's some outliers there between 2 and 2.5, meaning that within, you know, whatever. If you want to do quartiles or whatever it comes down to be. I'm more into, I, I personally, I'm more of a fan of confidence intervals than, uh, than you know, everything else outside of that. But next after that, let's go to our world data. That sounds so anticlimactic. All right, here we go. And here are our new cases smooth per million. Asia and Brazil. And we'll look at it in a second. Mortality percentage of positive cases still going down. So again, higher transmissibility. But overall, mortality, which really comes down to flatten the curve. This is on a global scale. And it looks like we've been pretty flat for a while. Let's keep it going. Boom, 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 boom. Saw that, saw that, saw that. Uh, this is what I want to show you. Great Britain, look at this. With the sound effects, without sound. Look at that, boom. Sweden. Now, interesting thing is they panicked. They, they went to a mass level of two, and they went to a mass level of two. It, there's a psychological aspect that I'm beginning to wonder about. You know, it's like when there's food poisoning scares, uh, diagnosis of food poisonings go up dramatically, you know, they only could be so many people infected by the food poisoning uh, event. And so you wonder if you start putting masks on people, if they think COVID more and you take masks off of people that think COVID less. Again, I'm not a psychologist or an epidemiologist, but still it'd be interesting correlation if that actually panned out any good research data. All right. And then we go there and per se, we'll just go down. There is the United States, new cases per million, pretty steady. Um, is it following the same pattern? What do you think? Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Let's move down. Cases down, down, down. Interesting aspect here. As the deaths in the United States, mortality percentage began to go up, Sweden actually began to pass the United States. Not a good thing you want to do. But however, though, they, for whatever reason, were so reluctant to pick up the mask thing. And 
then when they picked up the mask thing and they started masking up again it's really weird you could it's a very weak correlation because you could say well they masked up because of the higher mortality rate and vice versa but still it's they didn't do it before and now they did it so if I had to draw off controls when they didn't do it and they had just this higher mortality rate it went down pretty fast so how can you I mean yeah masks work great in labs uh, but in real world settings next time you walk by a person with a beard or a mustache and they have a mask on and you realize that masks primarily protect when they have a good fit uh, there was also another study on reference to you know double masks and so on and so forth it wasn't the doubling the mask that made the difference as far as that uh, you know two layers of masks what made the difference is when they did double masks is it reduce the amount of gaps uh, on the mouth or the mouth area and the biggest benefit to a mask is if it fits properly not how thick it is but how well it fits and if people wear beards and mustaches yeah that's an interesting thing and we already know that if they were really took the pandemic mitigation strategy seriously they would have had mask or facial coverings or shields that would have easily incorporated that beard thing uh, or or reluctance of uh, having facial hair, but they didn't. But the proceed, all right. There's that. Let's go. Let's go down. United States versus all of Asia. I believe that is Armenia. Uh, new death to USA versus all of Asia. It's really weird. Is that it? Yeah, I mean, we're talking all of Asia. Uh, next time I'll get get an idea uh, bearing on it. See, I'm looking at Armenia here, but there's those other colors that are green too, uh, like India and so on and so forth. Death per million, USA versus all of Asia. Uh, mortality versus of all of Asia. Again, they had a big thing with the Ganji River, and nothing happened. There was a thousand infections, a thousand infections, and it, out of tens of thousands of people. So that's which had like a infection rate of like 0. 0.001. So it's like, huh? And if I want to use that as a control, that's that's really. Uh, that's something else. I don't even know how many hospitalizations were. A thousand infections out of like close to hundreds of thousands. If someone could let me know. It'd be great. And so here we are. There's one mortality uh, in Asia for every 9,648 people. In the United States, there's one mortality for every 580 people. 4 billion, 463 million people, 462,539 mortality, poor souls. United States, 566,893 poor souls out of 329 million people. Again, what does Asia do different? The United States doesn't, even though Asia has a higher infection rate right now. So let's proceed. This is the world. Vaccines are right there. So again, people think that vaccines are changing the world. Mm, let's see. All right, there's that. Do, 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 do. There's the world. There's that. Those don't count yet. There's that. Now look at this. A red is mortality. And purple is new cases per million. That give you perspective as far as the enhanced transmissibility, transmissibility, and then the mortality. Something to look at. All right, I'm gonna move real fast. And there we are there. I just want to see if I can see look at this, look at the spike. Look at this. That's like a and that seems like it's gone down a little bit, but still. Again, I want to be fair. And to be fair, look at the data, even though I don't want to see it go up. That's my bias. But data is data. That's the beauty of it. All right. And in Africa, did, remember, it has, they still have the original SARS UV-2 virus in there, which is hardly ever found in the United States anymore. Odd, but still. Europe, eh. Uh, North America, hmm. Balanced. Oceania, again, pay attention to the y axis Y-axis there. All right. Uh, South America, steadying out. Thank goodness. I don't know why, but that's the highest it's ever been. Uh, and in the world, what it did, you know, it's that bounce there. Uh, let's see, da 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 da, going down here. Uh, if you want to read something from that, that's perfectly fine. But again, we'll look, we'll use what we got. New cases overall. I'm just going to scroll down real fast for you to get an idea of what's going on. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. All right. Yeah, let's go to Europe. Because Europe was going through lockdowns and stuff like that. So let's see if it made a difference at all. New cases per million. Right there, there's your y axis. This is Europe overall. This is all Europe, it's all grouped together. All right, and that's the beginning of the year. Mortality 
it actually went up a little bit. So think about that. And then it studied out. Case system mortality, right there. So that gives you the cases. I'm not saying a ratio. This is just the case system mortality. To put it in perspective. It's important. Again, I, you hear me mention cytomegalovirus. There's lots of viruses out there which are infect huge segments of the population, if not up to 100% of the population, where exposures and things like that, but yet, you know, they don't, you know, unless the immune system is compromised, they tend not to do anything, and they tend to coexist in the individuals for very, very long periods of time. All right, let's proceed. Correlations, other correlations. Do, do, do. There's the world. Heat map. Again, uh, my most interesting correlation here is, do, do, let's see. We are looking at deaths per million, 870. I'm looking for anything that we rate, we rate a heat map is 0.7 means it's possibly a causal relationship. So when you look at a heat map, what you're doing is you're looking at colors first, either in way negative, I mean way negative, which doesn't seem like we have here, or basically you're looking for like darker the blue. So like human development index is like directly related to life expectancy possibly, most likely, medium age, obviously, um, and so on and so forth. So you have a population here is strongly correlated with new death smooths. So which means probably the greater the population, the more likely you're going to have new deaths. Uh, median age doesn't mean density. Female smokers, again, this is, a, <laughs> again, it's a heat map, so we're not dealing with Kendall Tau or Spearman or Pearson or whatever it is, so just look at it. That is data, popular or not. Female smokers, 0.73, age 70 or older. I'm not saying anything, all right? It's still, there we go. Da da da, da da da, life expectancy. Remember, look for correlations there. You can define it, speeding through, speeding through. Do, 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 do. United States, remember when we first started this, was at 3.6, we got the 5.3, got really, really high. The United States is actually making some progress and doing pretty well against the rest of the world now. Its mortality rate is at 2.167, uh, and we saw it really high before, and that is really cool, a lot of numbers, but that's me messing around with something else. All right, world masks. Let's see. I didn't look at this yet. I'm just curious if uh, Oxford University updated the mask data. Because the United States, for example, yeah, it didn't update it yet. You see, they're showing, I mean, I have the data. The data is here from the um, April 10th, I guess, is the last data we had. I should be a little bit later, but I guess Zimbabwe is going to be our case example. Yeah, April 10th. And so let's just look down here. Because the United States, I mean, only 31, actually probably now soon, to only be 30 states have our mask mandates. So you really can't consider the United States a man the four. So there are three, and there was Solomon Islands dropped out of the mask game. Japan and Fiji are one. Tanzania is one. And of course... You know, there's Hong Kong or two. A lot of countries you think would be like threes or fours. And for those not familiar, one, it's recommended. Two, recommended in certain areas. Three, required. Four, required. So all these from here down to Estonia, Sweden, Bermuda, Bermuda, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Thailand, Ukraine, Uruguay, Greenland, Afghanistan. I could see that one being enforced. Finland, Netherlands, New Zealand, so on and so forth. They're not strict. Not like the United States and... You know, Pakistan, you know, Mexico, Peru, France, so on and so forth. So when you see that four, that's what you're looking at. So here we go. I'm just going to go down because I want to look at Brazil. Uh, well, here's a death per million in Sweden. You see what I'm talking about when they started issuing the masks? You see here, in the beginning of the pandemic, they stayed down. They did not put the masks up. And then they did. And almost, look at this. Looks like almost like the same pattern except it depends on when the virus is introduced. Uh, cases per million, didn't make a difference with the mask, it appears like, but definitely did irritate a lot of people. Uh, Brazil, here we are again with the variants, that transmissibility of that one variant we discussed in the very beginning, and there's that. And cases per million, pretty high. So they're driving a lot of South America. Japan, our Asian friends, Still a little bit uptick. Even mortality is virtually non-existent. New Zealand, again, red line is deaths per million. It's going down, 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 Finland, down. Uh, Finland, boom, again, don't know why one goes down, one the other. I'm, we're trying to find correlations. 
little bit of a desperate million. I mean, still compare it to the United States and other European and Western countries. Uh, case per million. Look at that. Tests and cases, which now look like to be one and one. Interesting. Uh, Spain. Remember, there was a concern with them for a while. Remember Spain, I think they found SARS-CoV-2 fragments in sewage in 2019 in Spain. Doesn't mean that doesn't mean that they did not escape from a lab or whatever it is, but if you were going to harvest SARS-CoV-2 and utilize it in future uh, you know, clinical trials or experiments or mutations to find out why or how, it would have been found in the sewage in Spain in 2019. France, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo, France, lockdown, happy, but you can't really tell if it does anything because you're always at a mass level four, then there was it, then how was your controls? United Kingdom, look at this. This is what I want to show you. Because remember the B117 variant. This is deaths per million. Look at that drop. Again, and they were only one to a mass level three, but it, you see the pattern, the algorithm. It doesn't mean that the pandemic mitigation lockdowns and things like that may not make a difference in some aspects. But if I'm looking at the data, you know, this is like before the lockdown, this is after the lockdown. And so, you know, how do you build a machine learning model based upon data like this? Because it looks like your lockdown measures are going to be inconsequential. All right, but there's that. Look at that. Now remember, all because you don't see a high cases per million here, Remember, testing wasn't really in play. So they started testing a lot, but now they're testing by tons. Look at that. It's like, wow, that's like freaking, that's like on long the X axis. So United Kingdom may be free. Look at this, cases per million. And the purple is just like, wow. Italy, you know, still got some issues, but it looks like it's hopefully on its way out. And there's that. All right, now let's go to hospital occupancy. In our favorite states here in the United States. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, I, I got to really rush here. We're running low on time. All right. Alaska, which we had in the beginning. California, still, I have no clue why we have lockdowns. Masks all over the place. New York. Again, this line right here. These are basically inpatient beds, inpatient beds used. Um, Writing from, I think, the CDC information. Iowa, no mask states. Uh, North Dakota, no mask. Mississippi, no mask. Texas, no mask. Again, you're a policymaker. You want to wreak havoc on your population. You know, do it for the right reasons, not because you're trying to, you're fearful of uncertainty. Uh, but again, I have no clue how it, and I would never imagine a state of emergency would abuse such power over a virus which has it can be something but again state of emergencies over uncertainty we can have a state of emergency all the time if you're always going to gamble on the you know the next boogeyman behind the corner or boogie female or boogie other individual just to, so to say and so if vaccine delivery was perfect on april 17 2021 this is what our, pop, our percentage would be, which is really interesting. I would expect it to be higher, but vaccine delivery seemed to have slowed. Now, keep in mind that Johnson Johnson and AstraZeneca did not include in the data because there's so much been wrong going on with recalls and things like that. It's, it's, it, it, it skews everything. But if we just go by Pfizer, Manura, um, it really was not a big change from last week. All right, let's go. And let's uh, rebuild our staff here. Staff, our charts. Doo -doo -doo. All right, which we looked at before us, so we saw that, and we're gonna go all the way up real fast and see if we come with any information. I know this is confusing. There's your data, hospitalized patients, nothing dramatic. I'm looking towards the end here. If you see anything that pops up, just write it down. No, they say again, this is the curve's like freaking flat. It's flat. It's flat like everywhere. It's really flat. It's like flat. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why we're so panicked all the time. I understand, you know, but. It's there's too much collateral damage. It's risk to benefit ratio with everything, and it also risk to benefit ratio to me personally also goes with societal. And when you're inflicting known damage to protect against the unknown, uh, you know, again, who am I to judge? New deaths per hundred thousand, no mask, loose restrictions in states. 
Um, look at this. It's just basically, look, the loose states across the board. Uh, no, just not, no. It's like they're, they're doing pretty good. The, the sky is not falling, thank you, media and press and newspapers and everything else like that. Say, oh, don't go to Florida. The world's going to come down there celebrating New Year's Eve. You know, thank goodness, because if someone didn't stand up and say, hey, you know, I'm beginning to question what's going on here. Yeah, there's always risks. There's always that one person that's going to get in a plane that's afraid to fly and the plane's going to crash. But, you know, here's your data. What's your justification for pandemic uh, mitigation shock lockdowns? Yes, they work well in a lab, but we have to deal with the real world here. And dysbiosis is sitting in the entire world. Is that such a word? Dysbiosis is sitting? I can't, I can't rationalize. New deaths per 100,000 and tight restriction states. And we're going back from the beginning. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Some little spikes there, but not really. Uh, there's your, if you want to compare, you know, apples to oranges or apples to apples, I should say. You're tight and you're loose. Uh, they look pr pretty similar, except the tight restriction states had huge spikes in the beginning, which could be a psychological reasoning for them doing tight restriction because they're afraid. But again, I, I still blame a lot of this on long-term care facility issues. All right, let's go back down. Mortality. There's just that. That's a confusing for a lot of people. I'm trying to save time. Da da da. Saving time. Look at this. Green loose states versus white states. It is new cases per 100,000. That's overall compared to the two. If you see that drop off there, that's because of um, a data anomaly. So that has to do with. Uh, I'm gonna try to risk something real. F yeah, I'm not gonna risk it yet, but that's because it did not count the uh, 18th as yet. So don't pay too much attention to this. It's not like it all of a sudden just stopped one day. Um, new cases per 100,000. You see the crossover? That was from March 8th. That's just to highlight it. And it's still growing. The Basically, the tire restriction states are still increasing. And the green restriction states, no go. Uh, look at the averages here. 100,000 rolling type. There we are, 127. Uh, basically, cases per 100,000 uh, is the mean between the tire restriction states. As opposed to 99.83 loose, uh, loose again controls, controls, controls. I mean, you're doing, you're causing people a tremendous amount of heartbreak and suffering, uh, and you're not outperforming the, the states which are have loose pandemic mitigation strategies. Yes, you are making sure that your uncertainty is taking a role, but no, the data does not support lockdowns. At least according to this, can it be wrong? Yeah, chances are it can be wrong, but as far as data is concerned. It looks like they're wrong. All right. And if they have better data, then show me. And there's that. And look at what happened here. Green states to white states, new deaths per 100,000. Right there. It began to change. All right. There's that. And that's a little bit of uh, more of a gap there. Again, don't pay attention to that last day. It's beginning to see where it's happened. The, even, if, even if the green states are beating the tight restriction states, it, it's still freedom versus lack of freedom. And the damage that goes along with it. I mean, for example, I mean, seriously, we kept liquor stores open as an essential service, but yet we, we shut down all other alcohol rehab places. It's like, no, that's bad. And again, delayed surgeries, cancer treatments, elective surgeries. People are afraid to go to the hospital because they're afraid of being sick and so on and so forth. So diabetes treatments, heart disease treatments. My gosh, once this, this Rubicon is crossed, I mean, no, no, there's going to be some strong rationale to keep that. What do you have here? That's California. California is probably a tight restriction state. It's California, which is a tight restriction state, played a huge role uh, in basically uh, causing the pandemic mitigation strategies to be appropriated. And there is that. Let's keep on going. Uh, new deaths per 100,000. We just covered that. There is that. And this is our tight restriction states. Remember we saw this, the Vermont that we played into role. Looked at it, the other things, your Maryland, da da. They all seem to be. Look at this, Michigan. See that they're tight rises, and then we have our, our loose restriction states and new cases. Uh, look again, data is data. Uh, no mask, loose restriction states as of January. There's a little. There's Iowa, North Dakota, a little bit of rise. So we'll give it that. Overall, though. We already looked at the data, 99 to 127. Tight restriction states. 
And I think that is going to be ended just about. Do, 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 do. And experimental data, which I'm looking at real fast. Experiment. This is the hospital, the ratio of cases to hospitalization. So you can have lots of cases, but very few hospitalizations. There is basically the data, which I think, from the beginning. And it began to stabilize. And then we went to our hotspots. All right, so let's go review, recap, and what we looked at so far today, or tonight, for those that are with me, for the full 55 minutes. Ta -da. We looked at COVID in dust, can last up to months, and dust seems to be a very favorable environment for the SARS UV 2 RNA fragments, at least. B117, according to basically the Lancet, which is to me a little bit more reliable than uh, any sort of network station. Uh, they basically are saying, yes, it does appear to be a thing, but however, though, it's not resulting in anything worse than anything else. Face coverings or face mask, however you want to word it. Yes, does increase breathlessness and claustrophobia and does reduce VO2 max by 29%. And we're going to correlate that with the research we had last week. Uh, could be a reason why the hearts stop uh, it, suddenly in young athletes when training with the masks uh, it correlates with that information before but again they didn't want to draw a causal relationship in the prior study last week but in this one they are trying to draw a causal relationship even though the power rating of the study is not exactly significant because it's a small scale study but however though it does blow away the conjecture from media pundits that masks make no difference because they have a agenda to push as opposed to basically actual healthy information. Uh, physical inactivity, yes, health once again, uh, which brings to the question shelter in places, lockdowns, and so on and so forth. Once again, uh, pandemic mitigation strategies need to be really, really looked at uh, to ensure that we don't repeat the same mistakes in the future and we keep people happy and healthy as opposed to healthy and not happy, which is not healthy. All right, and then one year later, of course, we, it's all supposed, supposed to be over in the 15 days we'll flatten the curve. We'll be over by Easter. It'll be done by the 4th of July. And yeah, that was last year. And so D614, because was the other original SARS is so old, no one can find it anymore except in, in parts of Africa. And of course, the irony, it, because as people are becoming immune, it's becoming a different form of a virus. It's thought that the mutation was driven by high levels of population immunity, which drove mutations in the spike protein to evade the immune system. A mutation driven by people that are immune to it. So, again, herd immunity? Uh, I don't know, but regardless of that, people seem to be doing much better. It seems the lethality is going down in most parts of the world. Transmission rates may be increasing, but however, though, data, 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 the links will be there for you to follow. Gratitude for listening. I hope you find this information of use. And again, um, any questions? If I get an opportunity, I apologize for not responding to the comments. Could have just been so busy. Uh, but please forgive me. Uh, but however, though, hopefully in the future, I'll be able to repair, uh, basically reply to the comments in a more prompt matter. Thank you. Gratitude. And look forward to you all once again very soon. See you then. Bye.